Broadcasting from their world headquarters in Texas, it's the Arcade Repair Tips Live Show. The show that discusses arcade repair, restoration, news, and more. Now, here are your hosts, Tim and Jonathan. Well, hello everybody and welcome to episode 4 of the Arcade Repair Tips Live Show. My name is Jonathan Leung. I'm the producer, director, and editor of the Arcade Repair Tips video series. And joining me today, as always, well, most of the time, is Mr. <laughs> Arcade Repair Tips himself, Tim Peterson. Tim, how you doing? Hey, good, John. Well, guys, we're excited to be here again for another live show. Now, we want to encourage you that if you have anything to say, comments, questions, we do have the live chat. And, Tim, we are monitoring it this time. We do have it up yes. on the window. Tim is my witness to that. So the live chat is there if you have anything that you want to ask us or if you have any comments about anything that we've talked about today. And we will be covering, Tim, some questions. We'll be covering some discussion. Uh, maybe we should tease a couple of things. I think that Stern announced a new pinball machine. Did you hear that? I heard a rumor. And I think it was a Star Wars machine. Maybe. <laughs> and so we will be talking about that later in the show. So thank you guys again for joining us. But before we get into questions, before we get into discussion, before we get into anything, Tim, how you doing? I'm doing good. Good. So what's been Great. going on? Give us a little update about your life, Chuck E. Cheese, and anything else that may be going on right mm. now. Well, I have officially started my vacation as of about an hour ago. So this so. is your summer vacation. My right? summer vacation is Congratulations, basically. by the way. Thank you. Because <laughs> I, I still have like two months, but I'm I definitely uh, needed some time off. Uh, but, you know, this time of year, um, glad to get through May. Uh, May is a tough time because we've got all those school groups and things like that. Now, uh, it, we should say that there's still at least one school district here that is still in school, uh, which is I, crazy to me. I mean, going I, I, in June, you know. I'd just quit if I had to go to June. <laughs> I'm like, June, May 30th to 31st is my limit. There I'd be go. like, last two days, I'm not coming. So, I understand. I don't know. <laughs> uh, what about where you guys live? I, I know some people it's normal, but I have never, it, just thinking about going to school in June is crazy to me. Absolutely. But Tim, I understand you've had a lot of school groups through there. You know, we talked in, you know, what, second week of May, I think it was the last time we did a live show. And you had mentioned that a lot of school groups had been coming in for the end of the year. So that's pretty much died off at this point, right? Yeah, hopefully. We did have one today because one school is still in. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, this time of year is when I, I kind of have seasons where I focus on certain things. You know, we talked about one time I was doing some cosmetic work. Right. Well, I have been doing animatronics. Uh, just tuning up Chucky for the summer and getting him all up and ready. Now, and you sent me some pictures, I noticed. Yeah, I sent some pictures. So I'm going to throw them up here for everybody I thought to see. everybody might like to see these because uh, if you've never seen... This actually is not my store. I was at a visiting store. Uh, this is a 16 movement Chucky, which so he doesn't quite have the bells and whistles that mine does. Mine's a 32 movement right. uh, one. This is a 16 movement, but uh, we were laughing and thus showing the pictures. Uh, I've never taken his head completely off. Right, and as you can see right here, it is missing. So, <laughs> so there is a head, headless Chucky here. Off right? with his head, but <laughs> I thought everybody might want to see or curious about what it looks like inside there. Mine kind of looks more like the Terminator. He has uh, got those black bars. He's a little more simple. He talks and uh, moves his head and stuff. Well, what we're trying to fix there was his neck. When I came in, he was staring at the wall backwards, kind of exorcist-like. So uh, didn't want kids seeing that, so I had to rebuild the neck area to keep his head from swiveling around. There you go. Now, over here, Tim, now, a lot of these now, can you take, like, the little mouse face off of this one, or is it all built in like that? Is that why we have it like that? <clears throat> I think that one is built in. Mine, actually, you can, and there may be a way to do this one, uh, but, boy, it, it is a tough job, I've heard, removing that, and they're really durable. That's one thing that I was kind of shocked about how durable that mask is. Yeah, so basically, in order to work on any of these uh, servo motors or anything like that, you've got to take that completely off and and work on those from there. Right. Whereas on yours, you could just take like the mouse face off and maybe work on it while it's on his body still. No, I, I generally take the back of the head off like it's in the picture, and you can get to most things from there. Gotcha, okay. So you've been rebuilding Chucky. Now, did you get, get it all back together? Yeah. You know, kids aren't going to be freaking out because, you know, no, they see all these motors. No, Five Night at Freddy Nightmares. Or <laughs> five Nights at Freddy's. Absolutely. <laughs> I think that's what we're all thinking about. Yeah, so. hopefully they will. Uh, they all see a good work in Chucky by the time we open the doors. This was really early yeah, in the morning. Yeah, and I'll show that one more time if you guys are just now joining us. So uh, this is Chucky's body without a head, and this is 
chick he's head without a body, right? There Is that what we're looking at? So uh, good stuff here from Tim, because apparently Tim's been working on Chucky. So uh, Tim, awesome stuff. What else have you been working on at Chuck E. Cheese besides uh, the mouse himself? Well, um, just general general restaurant stuff. You know, a lot of people think of a game tech at Chuck E. Cheese as just a guy who works on video games. We work on everything. And right. so uh, tuning up for summer again, you know, you've got um, just everything simple from uh, making sure the outside is landscaped right to making sure that the uh, soap dispensers in the restrooms are working, for sure. example. So uh, ovens. Cleaning of oven vents, things like that, getting everything ready for summer. Absolutely. Well, sounds good, Tim. Sounds like you've been busy, and mm -hmm. it's always good to be keeping busy. Uh, we have some comments here in uh, in the chat Tim will talk about. Somebody says, best part of my Thursday, YouTube Punk says. We're glad to be here <laughs> with you, YouTube. Obviously, it's the first Thursday of the month, Tim. We usually do these, so we thank you for joining us. Um, a lot of people like my shirt. Oh, okay. Okay, this is a cool it's shirt. Cool I don't even shirt. know where I got it from. I think somebody gave it to me, but uh, mm -hmm. it says homeschooled, if you can see it, with about you know six, five cartridges but. yeah so um obviously all games that are that are close to me tim i love um you know excite bike and super mario brothers all uh, great games so uh, uh it was a great pickup great shirt love this thing so uh yeah uh, some five nights of freddy's action yeah i think yeah. That that's exactly <laughs> what we were talking about there with uh, all the chucky <coughs> cheese stuff and everything like that so okay well tim is there anything else you want to talk about before we get into the questions no let's get on into the comments and questions okay it's gonna take me a second here folks but i'll switch it over to our outline and check it out okay so let's talk about the comments from episode three tim and this one is from greg and he says thanks jens for answering my questions definitely gave me some ideas the vector vga comes out in waves currently out I think out of stock, Tim, is what right. he means by that. The tip on using the Game Elf may be the best option. I can see a market for creating more converters since there's only one on the market. Yes, I'm in IT. I'm always thinking ahead. LOL. I tried the Star Wars on MAME and it's terrible. Thank you. So, Tim, if I remember correctly, Greg had a Star Wars and he's wanting to know how he could basically use a roster monitor with it right. or anything like that. We we recommended the Vector VGA, which is currently out of stock. Um, but you could do MAME. You could do several things, Tim. But really, I mean, in all, you know, really, for all intents and purposes, you really want to have a vector monitor for that, right? True. And that's really what it comes down to. Yes, you can use a converter. Yes, you can do some other things. But you really want to have a vector monitor. That's the way it was intended to be played, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, Greg, hopefully you don't have a problem with your Star Wars. It continues to run great. But there are options out there in case you want to use a roster monitor or if you want to um, use a converter or something like that. There's options for you, right? Yeah. Okay. We also had a follow-up from Julio, Tim, and I'll go ahead and throw his up here. He says, thanks for the help. I have another question, and Tim, he had asked us if he could use um, a Game Elf and four players. Yes. And we said that, as far as we knew, it was only two. He comes back with another Game Elf question, saying, what if I only build a joystick cabinet for my Game Elf board? Would I be able to hook it up to a TV instead of building the whole cabinet? Now, Tim, of course, the answer here is yes. Sure. If you wanted to, a lot of people refer to these as pedestal-type cabinets, Tim, where we can hook them up to the TV. You see some games come in pedestal, like uh, Golden Tee, I think. And yes. some of those uh, some of those type games come in a pedestal cabinet. You just hook them up to a TV. Uh, but, Tim, the thing about the Game Elf is it really doesn't have an output for a TV per se, right? Correct. And so you'll need something in order to convert it. And so what we have here is what you may need here, Julio, to do that. And that's a VGA to HDMI adapter with audio. So the Game Elf, Tim, has a VGA output. But we really want to get that to... HDMI, right? Because HDMI is what most televisions take nowadays. Right. And so this adapter will allow you to do that. Plus it has an audio jack that you can use to hook up to the audio jack on the game Elf. Now you will need to power it. And most of these use a USB plug. So you're looking at about plus five volts DC, something like that, that you'll need to supply it power with. Um, you should be able to get this from a switching power supply, Tim. So if you're using that to power the board, you could pull five volts off that and also power the adapter. Correct. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here. Um, but yes, you will need to power it, but something like this, Tim, really will give you the um, what you're looking for to hook up the Game Elf board to a television. Tim, and a any... lot of the newer TVs already have a VGA plug. Sure. It could go straight there. Right, but some of them also don't have the audio for the VGA input. And Very so, good. like, if you, like, let's say you can hook it up VGA, but there's no way to get audio along with the video. That's why the adapter really comes in handy. Exactly. So, I mean, that's what you're looking at. And, Tim, HDMI has pretty much become the standard as far as hooking up TVs are concerned. So, I mean, it, it is the standard now. So, we're looking at HDMI uh, really 
for for uh, most TVs, you'll be able to hook up with that. It's a great uh, connection, and you're going to have it on most TVs that you're going to hook up to. So, Julio, hopefully answers your follow-up. If you have any more questions about the game, Elf, please let us know. We'll be happy to help you out. Okay, Tim, let's move along here. Next, we have Keith, and Keith has a follow-up, and, and Keith asked this question last time. Tim, he says, thanks for answering my questions on the show. I appreciate what you guys are saying about original monitors and saving money, but I figured I could sell the old ones... I could help pay for the new ones. And Tim, if I remember correctly, Keith had several, uh, two games, I think, maybe a Gorf and a Cruising game that he wanted to replace the monitors in. He's going to go LCD. But we were encouraging him, obviously, not to do that, but to replace or fix the monitors he had. Uh, you know, either get a another CRT or fix what's in there. Um, it says that, which according to everybody who has done it, is highly recommended. And Tim, he's talking about replacing... Um, old CRTs with LCDs. And Tim, that you know, we've done that before, but I don't know if we necessarily recommend it, right? Well, especially on classic games. Right. I can say uh, sometimes they look too good. Exactly. And it kind of takes away that old school look and feel. But then again, I've replaced it in some driving games. I think it, like, they look really good. Right. So it kind of, to me, depends on the game and your use and uh, maybe a necessity out of sometimes you just have to put one in there. Absolutely. So, uh, kind of out of the group there, Keith, that according to everybody, I guess we're not everyone, right. but um, it's highly recommended to replace an LCD with a CRT. Most of the time, we're always going to recommend keeping your CRT if possible. He also says, like I said, I, like I said, having the HD screen gives me more options to putting other games in the cabinet too. Now, that is true, Tim. If you have an LCD, you have a couple more options as far as putting other things in the cabinet, such as a MAME step or something else. Right. He says, by the way, the GORF is not really working, and the cabinet is pretty trashed. Not sure if a collector would want it, but I like your idea of offering it up as a trade for another game. I was hoping to use the joystick for playing MAME Tron. Thanks to Tim for answering the CEC question too. I tell you what, before we get to that, so he says that um, his GORF's pretty trashed. Tim, it's amazing what some people can do as far as cabinet restoration is concerned. Yeah, and we've seen some pictures lately where I probably, would, even myself, would have thought this is a burn pile, you know? Right. And uh, so you never know. And somebody needs the parts or they can take that cabinet and take the best parts out of it. There's a lot of even just light holders and things that people want to keep original as possible. Somebody would probably want that, and then somebody will have the time and knowledge that may want to take that all the way and rebuild it completely. And it should be said, too, you can leave the original joystick on there, and they do make like a replacement joystick, Tim, that looks like a Tron joystick, yes. if you want to use it for MAME. And, and you could probably find one that's already kind of made for USB setup, so you could just plug and play it. You wouldn't have to worry about wiring it all up like you would with the GORF one. So, yeah, I mean, it's totally up to you, Keith, but good stuff there. But yes, you could use it for MAME Tron, but it's just as easy to get another joystick for that that looks yeah. like that, right okay let's continue here thanks to tim for answering the cec question too more stories from you guys would be a great addition to the show interesting acquisitions funny cec stories etc tech tips are great but stories give color which makes it even more fun by the way pinout is great thanks for the recommendation you guys keep up the good work keith so tim we've got him here and uh, he likes you know the cc question now, we told a lot of stories on the podcast for you guys who used to listen to the Question and Answer podcast, which is now hosted by Eric and Chris. Yes. Uh, me and Tim hosted 59 episodes of that. Right. And mm -hmm. in those 59 episodes, we told a lot of stories, right? Sure. <laughs> and so, if you want to hear some of the stories, you can go back and listen to that. But Tim will share other stories, I'm sure, as we go along here. Do you have yeah. anything you want to share real well, quick? Well, I'd or? like to say that if uh, people are interested in the history of Chuck E. Cheese, they can go to our Facebook page. You posted a great article that talks a lot about how Chuck E. Cheese was founded by Nolan Bushnell. And this, yeah, the article's on fastcompany.com, Tim. You guys can go to our Facebook page or Twitter feed. You'll see it posted there. But it does have a great history of the company, Tim. And the thing about it is, is that, that I mean, it's 40 years now. Yeah. And people don't even realize that. It's the 40th anniversary of Chuck E. Cheese. It's been a really long time. But if you want to find out how it all came to be, highly recommend checking out that article on Fast Company. And Tim, I think maybe next month we'll cover people's comments on that and thoughts because it really is an interesting story. And Tim, I wasn't aware of some of the details in there either. Yeah, you know, me, after even me. Yeah, it was a, there was even some um, details that I'd, I've never heard, even some stories about it. And I, a lot of it I kind of knew, 
And I've heard some, I think, that it probably aren't in print. Maybe we'll share them with that. They, so, <laughs> they I'll go. give you the real story, the back story. There you go. So we'll tease that the for rumor. next month. That's know. right. We'll mm-hmm. do a little uh, Chuck E. Cheese history with Tim and also go over that Fast Company article a little bit. Um, but you guys can go to our Facebook page and our Twitter feed to check that out right now. So uh, good stuff. And I appreciate you mentioning Pinout. Tim, did you get to play Pinout on your phone? I have not uh, downloaded it yet uh, or played it, but i uh, it's it sounds fun. like it's fun. He it liked fun. it. so I, I'm still playing it. I still like it. Uh, it's a great uh, game to just kind of pick up and play for a little bit. And, you know, If you like pinball, it's kind of like endless pinball. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you haven't played Pinout yet, highly recommend it. It's, it's available for your App Store, iOS, all that good stuff. So uh, check it out, and uh, you know, you'll know you you'll thank me later, apparently. So right. that's how that works. Um, before we go on, Tim, and I think we're getting into the actual questions now. That was kind of like the follow-ups comments. Uh, let's go over to the live chat before okay. we move on to the actual questions. And it looks like a pedestal is a good option for a smaller footprint, uh, is what mm-hmm. YouTube Punk here says. And I agree. If you want a smaller footprint, you don't want all of the space of like a full-size arcade. Plus, you can hook any TV to it, so it gives you a lot of flexibility for size of TV that you want to want to use. So I've actually uh, thought of it as a good option for the opposite. Like you have a really big screen TV. Right. You can kind of hook up your footprint to down there, or the pedestal. And there you are, you can see it on this great big screen, but you right. can kind of be chilling in a recliner or something. So if your man cave has a big TV already, yes. it'd be a good thing to just go ahead and hook this up and then you'll have games along with your big TV. Yeah, that's my idea. I've always thought about it would be good in that scenario too. Yeah. Okay, and Nightwing Ben 101 says, shout out to Ben. Hey, Ben. <laughs> I guess that's him. Okay. Okay, there you go. We shout it out to you. There you go. And then YouTube Punk comes back. Besides home arcades, do you guys have... Also have a separate dedicated game room for console PC gaming. No, we, <sighs> Not you really. know, one time we kind of had an area in my game room. We right. had uh, a little back corner kind of yes, dedicated to that. Actually, we took a cabinet that we got from Chuck E. Cheese. It was a Chuck E. Cheese memory match. And uh, we kind of made and put the home consoles up in it. And right. we could switch between the different consoles one time. I don't guess we ever had any pictures of that, but... We kind of had an area for it. I could probably find some somewhere if I look. Yeah. But uh, for me, the console gaming I do is in my living room. So yeah. I have an Xbox One hooked up in there. Um, I have a Retron 5. I've got a PlayStation 3 still, Tim. And I've got a Wii U hooked up in there right now. Those are the four I think I have. But yeah. um, if I'm gaming, I'm usually doing Xbox One. You can play a lot of good classic games on the Xbox One. Uh, or the Wii U because my daughter likes Mario. And so a lot of times we'll play that. But we don't really have a decade room for that. Um, I have some console games in the game room. Have some in the living room. Just it wouldn't depends. be a bad idea because we got a bunch of them just sitting in storage. That's right, exactly. So, we... so, I mean, you might as well bring them out and let people play them for sure. So, um, But thank you for that question, YouTube Punk. And we're going to continue on here with the questions that we've gotten via email and on our YouTube page. And so, Tim, the first one we have here is from the Nosebleeds. Yeah. Okay. okay, which is obviously a YouTube name. And he says, I have a Donkey Kong cocktail table that's playing semi-blindly. The monitor powers up to the preview screen with invisible ladders, score, and bonus timer. The screen is also at its highest brightness. Any idea what's going on or what I would need to get fixed? My opinion is that it's an original monitor. uh, My opinion is since it's an original monitor, it's worn out. Thanks in advance and love the channel. So Tim, we have from the nosebleeds here. And he's got a semi blindly playing right. Donkey Kong. I understand where you mean. Okay, so um, obviously he's saying the invisible ladders, the score, and the bonus timer are gone. Okay. You can see everything else, but those things are gone. So so my question to you is, is this, uh, what kind of issue is this? Is this a monitor issue? Generally, this would be more of a board issue. Right. Like if ships or something on the board, um, yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, you, well you're not, they can't, they're not they can't seeing see it. it. But yeah, what we have here is exactly what you said, Tim. Um, from the description, it's probably a monitor issue. Probably not a monitor issue. More than likely, it's a board issue. And the yes. reason why is because we're missing specific elements. Right. You know, if it was like we're missing all of one color or or we're, um, you know, we're missing the entire screen or, or something like that, we may think more monitor issue, right? Right. But the problem is that we're missing basically what... We have in the picture here, we're missing ladders and we're missing bonus or missing high score, which sounds more like a board issue. Now, the screenshot I found on uh, the, the um, this website here, it's Donkey Kong Technical Info, and it's the brasington.org slash arcade slash tech slash DK website. And if you have this screenshot here, Tim, according to this website, it indicates that you have a bad 2N 
Okay. And that's a that's a that's a prom 256 by four that you will need to replace. Right. On the board. Okay. Now, anytime Tim though you have board issues, we highly recommend checking out our post on inspecting an arcade board. Which uh, here's the URL for that. Of course, arcaderepairtips.com. Um, but you can find a whole lot of what we recommend as far as board repairs go there. Um, you know, basic level. You know, there's more advanced stuff that you can do, but this is kind of the starting point for board repair as far as we're concerned. So, but in from the nosebleeds case, considering he's got something exactly like the picture we're looking here, we're probably looking at a board issue and probably looking at a bad two in chip that sounds, so on the board. So, sounds like it to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, like you said, we're missing specific <clears throat> elements, and that's really that's really what it is. I mean, we're missing since we're missing the specific elements. That's why we're probably having a board issue. Now it does mention issue. the brightness is up really high, and it may be that it does need a cap kit and yeah. something like that. Your monitor that. may still need work. Yes, Correct. may, but those issues are probably more board related. Absolutely. So from the nosebleeds, hopefully answers your question. Uh, that website again is uh, www.brasington.org slash arcade slash tech slash DK. If you do a search, Tim, though, on Google for Donkey Kong Technical Info, you'll find it. But it's a great site. shows you lots of screenshots and what could be wrong based on the screenshots. So uh, if you got Donkey Kong, great website to bookmark. But uh, from the nosebleeds, hopefully that helps you out. And good luck getting that Donkey Kong game back up and running 100%. Okay, Tim, we got Rocky. And Rocky says, hey, yo. No, <laughs> I have a Cruisin' Exotica sit-down racing game, which has completely lost the color green. I watched your video on this, but I don't see the red, green, blue pins you're talking about. Do you know what 39-inch monitor is in the game and how I go about figuring out what happened to the color green Rocky? Now, Tim, I did some research, and I found that the most common 39-inch monitor that's in the 39-inch Cruisin' is the Neotech NT3501. Okay. Okay, so if you need, if you're looking for what monitor may be in your machine, Rocky, it's going to be the Neotech NT3501 is probably the monitor that's in there. Of course, you'll want to compare pictures with chassis and things like that just to make sure. Mm -hmm. Now, Tim, here's the thing, though. We have completely lost the color green. Right. So where does Rocky need to go from here? What does he need to do to restore the color green? Well, generally, uh, if you have no color at all, zero, right. then um, he d he was right to try to check the two, but right. I, I highly recommend that you look at the wiring first. Sure. Most times, we want to jump to a capacitor or a transistor or something, but a lot of times it's in the wiring. If you're not getting the green wire or the green uh, video feed from your chassis, then you won't, I mean, from your board and everything, then you won't get green on your screen. Right. So I would highly recommend that he goes and checks his wiring. And then if it's if his wiring is good, everything's wired up fine, then we're going to look at the transistor, the drive transistor, and see if it's okay. And Tim, exactly what you said is exactly what I put on the slide. Imagine okay. that. So there you go. Um, so yes, the color wires that run from the game harness to the monitor, those are the monitors we want to take take a look at. They attach to the monitor chassis via input pins and a connector. If you can't locate these pins, trace them from the game harness using the pinouts. And most of the time they are color coded. If you look at this picture, you can bring, oh, okay, that, back I'm gonna bring that back up. Okay, I'm going to bring that back up here. You'll point there, Johnson, you'll see the RGB which is red, yeah. green, and blue. That's right a red here. wire, a green wire, red, and a blue wire. green, blue. There we go. You guys can that see That being that. said, that doesn't mean that it wasn't prepared by, uh, you know, Joe's uh, TV repair service back in 1988, <laughs> and he might have not have had a green wire that day, and he might have used orange. So don't you can't. That's not always a hundred percent correct, but most of the time, and a good tech would uh, repair it that way makes it a lot easier. So you can actually look for that green wire a lot of times will be that wire. Absolutely. So Rocky, hopefully answer, answers your question. What you want to do is you want to trace the wiring down from the game harness to the monitor, Tim. Yes. And then also make sure that the pins on the monitor themselves are soldered well because a lot of times, Tim, those will come loose or cracked over time plugging that connector and unplugging it from that chassis board. Yes, we have flipped the chassis over, reflowed the connectors, and fixed a lot of color issues like right. that. Right, input pins are very important. So make sure you reflow the solder on those if you feel like they're cracked. So that's a big deal. But yeah, it's um, it really is just, I mean, what you really need to be careful of though is like frayed wiring as well, Tim. Making sure that the pins at the harness as well are making a good connection to the board, which yes. also makes a difference. So there's wiring and then connections on both ends, monitor side, board side. And then again, if all that connection checks out, Tim, probably a drive transistor, right? Probably so. And so I'll go ahead and put this back up here real quick. You can go to um, our post on checking a monitor tube, which uh -huh. you can find on our website. There's the URL. But if you go there, you will actually be able to um, see us replacing a drive transistor, what they look right. like, and get an idea of all that. Uh, again, that 
post is called Checking a Monitor Tube. Search it on our website, or you can type in the URL right there and get to it. Now, Tim, I, I emailed Rocky, let him know we were going to cover his question today. Okay. And he let me know that his wife is due in a month and that they're having a baby. So what I'm going to say to Rocky is congratulations. And I understand if you don't have time to get around to this for a while, right? Yeah, and I'll see you at Chuck E. Cheese in a couple <laughs> <That's right>. years. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and Tim will see you at Chuck E. Cheese in a couple of years. But congratulations to Rocky and his wife, and thanks for writing in about your question. Hopefully you get some time to actually work on this at some point with all of the baby stuff that's going on. So again, congratulations, and look forward to hearing from you soon. Okay, Tim, we'll go over here real quick. Um, I got a couple more questions here. Uh, we shouted out to Nightwing Ben. We'll shout out to you again. Ben, uh, you know, thanks for being here, and, you know, uh, thanks for joining us on the podcast. And then it says, uh, YouTube Punk, are you guys working on a Volume 5 DVD? Well, always, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we are, yes. Very um, thoroughly. Yes, very thoroughly. I don't know when that's going to be released or uh, what time frame we have for that. We have some projects coming up, Tim. One in particular that's going to be probably a pretty in-depth video. Yes. That's kind of a sponsored video. Okay. And so we'll have that coming up. You're going to go I mean, ahead and uh, Not going to say anything. Nope. Bit? Nope. All right. Nope. Nothing. Uh, can't, can't tease right now, but mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a sponsored video, and it's going to be longer, and you're going to be able to see all of it, and it'll probably go on Volume 5 DVD as well. Um, but hopefully we'll have some good videos. We have some videos, Tim, we haven't released that may end up going on Volume 5 just because, um, you know, it's like I didn't get a whole lot of time to edit them, so the editing is not as good as I'd like. And mm -hmm. so maybe we'll put those on the Volume 5 DVD as kind of like extra bonus stuff. We'll okay. see. Okay. But anyway, um, we also got one from Nightwing Ben. He says, um, Rory's question on your website. Okay, we've got Rory's question. That's coming up later. Not going to okay. talk about it now, but we'll get around to that. Uh, let's see here. We have Lee. Uh, Lee just texted in here, Tim. Okay. Send a message. He says, my MK2 home use is starting to rust out on the inside. No water, but the metal inside, power supply, piano hinges, etc., is getting specks of rust. How should I fix this and what prevents future rust? So what's a good way to um, get the rust out of his arcade cabinet and prevent future rust, Tim? That's a really good question. Um, I know that, um, you know, it needs some, some fans and some airflow will right. help right. a little bit. Um, as far as preventing it in the future. Yeah, preventing it in the future. One thing that we don't talk about a lot, but I like to do is I like two fans. I like a fan going in and a fan going out. Sure. And if you can put those, say, one at the bottom of your cabinet and one at the top, I like good airflow. Right. To me, that helps, especially you guys that have a pole position. Man, we put fans all in that. That, <laughs> that game needs about six fans. <laughs> and uh, maybe a, like a box fan. I don't know. Sure. It, needs, it has a lot of heat problems. That will help future rust. Now, I know there are some products, and of course, we're, we're coming live here. We may have to do a little more research. Um, but there's plenty of stuff if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and talk to them. There's probably some stuff. But one thing that you could do that wouldn't affect with like a clear coat or something if you right. had an area. Uh, just rubbing it down with some steel wool and then uh, a little bit of touch-up paint or something. I remember um, Pops used to use like a uh, grinder, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's something else that you can use, something like that. Or, um, I mean, you know, to get that off there. Of course, you want to use like, I don't know what kind of um, wheel you'd use on that. Yeah, or but... like a Dremel. Right. A Dremel is good because you can put the little wire brush wheel and kind of get down on there. But, um, you know, there is some stuff that... Um, I, I can't think of the name of it right now, but I know if you go to, you know where the best place to go, John, would be an auto, I don't, oh, auto yeah. store. Because, I mean, plastic car stores are always using this stuff. Exactly. Right? Go to, like, your, um, you know, not just your auto zone or something, more like a, a, a place that carries a lot of automotive paint, maybe good stuff, you know. Right. And uh, you tell them, um, I'm thinking of, like, Napa or somewhere, and you go and you tell it, but even AutoZone and Pet Boys would have something like this. Tell them that you want to prevent rust from happening or sh from spreading. See what they recommend. They're going to be some kind of coating or, or type of paint or even a clear. I know there's a clear something that I'm thinking of. Kind of looks like a nail polish. Right. And you could do that and that might would stop that area. Okay. Good question, though. Do I would more really research. like to do some more research I was about to say, we'll, we'll have uh, Tim pull out his phone here in a minute, and we'll find more about it. But uh, anyway, yeah, Lee, good question. So we'll try to do some more research to get back to you with maybe some more stuff. I know we've talked about that in the past, and it seems like we've recommended some products, but it's been a while since but we've done that. But one thing that I think is getting that airflow in the cabinet, because you need to get some of that moisture out of there. Right. Okay, and also uh, will help with molds and stuff like that. Sounds good. So... 
Okay, Tim. Well, let's continue on here with the pre-prepared questions. Okay. And, and the next one we have here is from Jade. And Jade says, I just acquired an original Sega Starblade arcade, and I purchased the Transformer to replace the non-working one. There are notable differences, and I don't want to make a mistake connecting it since it looks as if they were, they modified the power relay to connect it. Is there a way that you can assist me and help in understanding how or what I need to do in order to connect this properly? Thank you, Jade. So, Tim, Jade's got a Sega gun blade, and I know that Sega is a four-letter word in right. your world. I mean, obviously, um, this Transformer probably has like a million connectors coming out of it, mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be. But, I mean, to be honest with you, Gunblade's a newer game. Yeah. So you would think that this would be a pretty plug-and-play Transformer. Do you have any experience with Gunblade at all? I mean, I don't. You know, that's a little violent for Chuck E. Cheese. Not... It may not be something. Um, Let's Go Jungle would probably yes. be something that would be equivalent to it. Or um, Aliens Resurrection. Yes. Would be probably closer to what you would have at your place. And I will tell you, I just have some recent experience with... Uh, here's the thing that I that I don't like about Sega games. They are very proprietary. Right. They have, for instance, Let's Go Jungle has a power supply in there. It's pretty much a switching power supply, but they made it with connectors on the end that only their stuff plugs into. So I can't just throw a hat switching power supply in there. Right. I needed one the other day. You got to get one from Sega. Three hundred and sixty-five dollars. Ah. So I just want to say that it is probably something that is specific like that. Right. I, I don't know for a fact, but I bet you it is. And you also have to watch about Sega's games and their two twenty hookups. Right. Because uh, they're Japanese. Yes. Right. They will Japanese a lot of company, times. Which is actually 100, but also for Europe as well. Right. For Europe, mostly. Right. So I went into Sega Games, thought, oh, it's a bad Transformer. And what they usually have is a stepper or a step down that goes from 220 to 110. And then right. they'll go to their switching power supply. Sure. So watch out for that Transformer and make sure that it is. So you may actually need 220. To go to your stepper board right. that goes then, then goes on. So you're thinking I'm reading a hundred here, it should work, and you're really low for what it is. So really going to need to check into your manual and uh, f follow the wiring schematic for that. And here I'll show them what we got here. So I mean, you know, it looks pretty plug and play, Tim. It's got connectors on it. There may be one or two loose for wires, and this is a, a picture we got from an eBay auction. They usually are plug and play if you buy the right Sega part. The only thing that worries me is that in her original question, I'll go back to it so you can see it. It says that it looks like they modified the power relay to connect it. Yeah. Which means that somebody has probably made some modifications to this. And so what we would say is if you want to send us a picture of your setup, we'll try to help you out with it, Jay. Because we're not exactly sure what they've done. We're going to have to see it, right? Right. But by following your wiring, you want to see... What you want to know is what are, what voltage are you starting with and where is it in? And you see, and the wiring schematic, Tim, is in the manual. Exactly. And here's a link to it here that you can get to. And we'll uh, put this in the show notes, too, so you can get to it. But if you go here, there's a wiring schematic that will show you what voltage is supposed to go where, right? Yes. And so you won't have to worry about it as much. And, Tim, you've mentioned this before, but Played Amusement supports Sega games. They do. And as new as... Gunblade is, they should still support it. Yeah, right? and they're they're good people and pretty nice too, and they they don't mind talking to hobbyists and collectors. They want to sell you a part, right? Of course. So they will try to get uh, to help you, and they're they're really nice. So talk to Played Amusements. That's your U.S. distributor for Sega games. And, and, and their website is playedamusements.com. Real simple. As easy as it can get. So playedamusements.com, you can go there and you can get more information, Jade, if you need it. Of course, send us a pic. We'll try to help you out as best we can, Tim. Uh, but it really does look like plug and play. You may need to um, see the wiring schematic in the manual here, Tim, uh, just for a couple of details. But overall, it should be a pretty simple, pretty simple process. But... Jade, if you have any questions about it, you know, just holler back at us, let us know. But hopefully um, that'll get you going with the wiring schematic. And again, you can also contact Plate Amusements. Um, you could have maybe the wrong transformer even, and they can verify that you got the right replacement transformer. Uh, they could also ver verify some other things with you if you want to go that route. They, so. And they usually sell connectors and re... Because, so, you know, I have run into that where I've tried to work on a Sega game. I'm like, this ain't even the right plugs. And a lot of times they will sell the harness and plugs and a lot of stuff too. Awesome. Sounds good. So, Jade, hopefully answers your question. Get back with us with a pic of whatever your issue is, and we'll try to help you out further. You can also check the manual for Gunblade. We got the link, and we'll post it in the show notes. Or contact Plate Amusements at PlateAmusements.com. Sega distributor for North America, right, Tim? Yes. Okay, good stuff. So, Jade, hopefully answers your question. Good luck getting that Gunblade back up and running. Okay, Tim, let's move on here. Let's go to Lee. And Lee says, hey, guys, big fan of the site and your channel. 
I recently bought a 1986 Trojan machine. It worked fine for about a month, then I started having issues with the background of the game. The background was inverted and would show up in random blocks. I thought it was the power supply issue. I adjusted the voltage which seemed to work intermittently. I swapped out the power supply and it didn't make a difference. Thanks for any help you can offer. Okay, Tim, so let's go ahead and talk about Lee's question here before we go on to the solution. <clears throat> Obviously, Tim, he's got a Trojan here, and he's having a lot of problems with the background. Now, he right. specifically says the background. Right, that's okay. a key word here. Right, and so in this case, you know, we probably would have told him to check his power supply, right? Yeah. And guess what? He did it. He did. And it turns out it's probably not a power supply issue, so where do we go to now? Well, if you're having... A, it's kind of like the Donkey Kong question. Yeah. Because you have certain elements... Not the whole screen, right. not half the screen, right. or in the middle of the screen. <laughs> it's you know, it's not kind of a monitor problem. It's probably more of a board issue. Right. So we're looking at a board issue here, and you know, Tim, we mentioned inspecting an arcade board, Tim, uh, before, which are, is our post on our website about inspecting arcade boards. It's got some great information. Definitely a starting point for that. Mm -hmm. But I did a little research here for him, so we could kind of give him some additional information. And it does sound like a board issue. And Trojan runs on the Capcom Section Z hardware, okay. uh, which is the same hardware that Section Z runs on. Coincidentally, and you can get more information about that at the System 16 website. There's a URL right there. But the big thing here, Tim, is that there are repair logs for Section Z. Um, if you look at the fifth system, uh, symptom down on uh, this ocarcade.com/au, sounds exactly like what Lee is experiencing. Wow. Exactly, and I'm not going to read it here, but um, it sounds very similar. Section Z and Trojan kind of had a similar, you know, gaming style, and so he, just like he's having problems with this background. Um, this guy was having problems with his Section Z background. Gotcha. And he's got the instructions there. Again, it's the fifth sy symptom down on that page, and it has a lot of great information. So I'm going to let you go there, and that's wiki.ocrcade.com slash index.php. We'll put this in the show notes. You can, uh, we'll link to it later so you can get to it. But that really does sound like exactly the symptoms you're experiencing, and it's got some great steps there that you can take to get them fixed. And so instead of going those over the show, Tim, we're just going to refer them there, and that should hopefully give him what he's looking for as far as... Um, as far as that goes. I think they said something about being a clock or timing issue with the board. Okay. I believe is what it has to do with. So, Interesting. Uh, yeah, so probably something you need to look up on that side. If you have additional questions about it, we can help you out a little bit and hopefully help you troubleshoot a little bit more. Uh, but I think overall, that's going to be the key to getting your board fixed. So again, uh, check out the ocrk.com.au section Z repair logs. And about the fifth, fifth symptom down should have some great information about your problem. But uh, if you have any additional questions about it, let us know, Lee. We'll try to help you out further. But uh, thank you for your question. Good luck getting that Trojan arcade game back up and running. Okay, Tim, let's move to Tommy. And Tommy says, greetings, guys. Hope you're all doing well. All doing right. well, Tim? Yeah, I'm doing great. There you go. My name is Tommy, and I recently won an original Gorf Upright Arcade at a local auction. It is my first time owning a classic arcade game. Hopefully it won't be the last one either. But upon getting it home, it has a slew of problems and I do not know what to do. First, the original linear power supply looks like it's toast. I don't have a multimeter yet, but upon visual inspection, the leads are bad and there's quite a bit of discoloration. Second, I have no way of testing the PCBs, much less the power supply. Third, the monitor, again upon visual inspection only, appears that it needs to be replaced. I was thinking about putting in an updated LED type of monitor, one that mimics the old style monitors, but how would I power it? Would a newer switching type power supply help some of these problems? Finally, the power cord also needs to be replaced badly. I am not even going to try to plug that thing in at my house. I appreciate any and all help you could offer. Thanks for all you do, and I hope to hear from you guys soon. Tommy. Uh, so Tommy here, Tim, has something that happens to a lot of guys right. whenever uh, we get a game at the auction sometimes it's not in the best of shape right and there's a little clause down at the bottom of that auction contract that says as is it. where is right. <laughs> i think is what it is yeah. as is where is something like that so yeah you can't return it no returns no refunds right i can resell it for you right but no returns no refunds so tommy basically bought this thing at an auction it was in rough shape and it's still in rough shape now tim he says here <coughs> that the linear power supply looks like it's toast okay mm -hmm. now here's the thing though he says i don't have a multimeter yet Right. Okay, so he doesn't know for sure. I mean, because that's how you'll know for sure is if you check it with the multimeter right and it's working. Right? Yeah, he's going to have to start off with his, with the first arcade toolbox and get him some stuff first. That's right. We have a first arcade toolbox video that he should watch and post that has all the links to all the stuff you need to buy. Definitely recommend that for Tommy here, Tim. But really, when it comes down to this, I mean, let's assume, Tim, that that linear power supply is toast. Now, he could rebuild it. Yeah. Okay, and, and, you know, you can get rebuild kits, um, and there's a lot of great information there. But, Tim... 
as with all repairs, I think we're going to kind of start with the ASAP method, right? Yes. Always start at power. Exactly. And that's why we're going to say power supply, power supply, power supply. So your options are to rebuild it. Yes. Or to replace it, right? And so let's talk about both those options for a second here. Okay. And the first one we'll talk about is replacement. Or actually rebuild, excuse me. So, um... Bob Roberts has some great information on his website about the Midway 9411 power supply. Right. Okay, and you can go to therealbobroberts.net slash 90411.html for some great information. Bob sells rebuild kits, but he is not currently taking orders on them. Correct. As you probably know, he stopped taking orders in, what, October? Something like that. Uh, last year. Um, but he has all the parts listed on his website in, in this uh, website here. So you can order all the parts individually. From a parts supplier, if you want to, like, uh, you know, mouse or kit, digikey. You can order the parts and then make your own rebuild kit. Yes. Okay, so that's one way to go about it. Now, Tim, let's say and that... it might not be the best... I mean, it might be the good... It would be the cheapest and a good place to start. Right. Why not try it? Right. Try the rebuild kit. That's a... You know, if you're going to... And if it's not going to... If it's going to work, it may fix a lot of issues. If it doesn't work... You haven't really wasted a lot of money and you learned some experience before you toss it. Exactly. I mean, what's it going to be, like $20 or $30 worth of parts probably? Yeah. I mean, something like that, but you've learned a lot in that process of trying to fix it, right? But if you get to that point where it didn't work or you, you don't, or you're just kind of tired of messing with it and you want to move, upgrade, you can go to Arcade Shop and get one, right? Right. And so what we have here is a picture of the Midway Power Supply Conversion Kit number two. And what this is, is this will convert your... Linear, you know, the linear power supply that's in it to a switching power supply, Tim, and has the adapter, and you just plug up the connector to this thing, you tap into the AC on these guys, and you're good to go. We did this before, too. We have done this before. Mm -hmm. We have. Um, we've never filmed it, I right. don't think. Well, we talked, we did a little bit in the uh, Miss Pac Man Multi K yes. video, just a little bit, but it's a little bit different on these. We've done uh, kicks, we did kicks, yeah, we yeah did a long a time ago, it. before we did the website, even mm -hmm. we did a kicks with this, these conversion kits. Now, Tim, we prefer, if at all possible, to keep the original stuff running. Sure. But this is a great option if you are you know, you know, try the rebuild kit and you're still not working or you can't find a replacement power supply. Um, highly recommend the Arcade Shop conversion kit. And, Tim, the nice thing about these is since they are switching, you can guarantee the voltage. Yes. But like we found out in Williams games, for instance, sometimes using a different power supply will cause weird things to happen. That is true. And so that's why we recommend using the original stuff when possible. But if it's not possible, the conversion kit is a great place to, is a pl place to go after that. So, okay, Tim, let's uh, move on here. Now, obviously, he's having problems with the board. Right. Okay, but it's really hard in here. I'll show this. It's really hard to make sure that the PCB is working if you don't have good power going to it. That's true. And so what we want to make sure is we want to make sure that the power supply is working properly before suspecting any problems with the GORF board. Okay, once we have the power supply working, Tim, at that point, we can go on and try to troubleshoot our GORF board. Now, um, if you need help repairing your monitor, because you said that you know your monitor's probably toast too on visual inspection, we have lots of info on monitor repair on our website, arcaderepairtips.com. We have a whole section on monitors and screens, Tim. We shot a couple videos on yeah, it. Yeah, just a couple. Uh, I think we've done quite a few <clears throat> that will help you out with this kind of repair. And Tim, he mentioned the power cord is just terrible. And guess what? We've got information on that too. Check out our post on replacing a power cord. Yes. For that. Now, once you ensure that your power cords are placed, your power supply is up and running, and your and then you you ensure that your PCB is getting good voltage. If you're still having problems with your PCB, then we start suspecting the board, right? Right. At that point, um, but the monitor may be in good shape, Tim. We have seen monitors with just coats of dust on them, mm -hmm. looked hacked together as all get out. Rusty. That work. <laughs> yeah. Rusty. Mm -hmm. That still work. And so, visual inspection on a monitor is not always a great thing to go by if we're looking at getting it working, right? Correct. And so make sure that your power supply is working. Try the GORF boards. Typically, Tim, once you get power supply working, you'll get something out of your board. It may not be what you want. Right. It may not be the game, but you'll get flashing, you know, sprites or you'll get something. I mean, unless the board is just totally toast, you'll typically get a little something out of the board once you put good voltage to well, it. What I like to recommend is while you're doing all this other stuff, you got he's got a lot of work. One of the guys commented in the post, this, got, this guy's got his a lot of work. Yeah, project cabinet. But quiet a project cabinet. Yeah, but that's okay. And uh, just you know, while while I would work on that other stuff, a lot talk to some of our uh, board repair guys. Tell them I don't know if it works or not. Can you test it? A lot of them may not charge you much to test it at all. Right. And then if it needs repair, go ahead and fix it. But sometimes it's worth the twenty five, thirty, four, fifty dollars, whatever For they would cost, to just to test. 
and make sure or maybe there's some bulletproofing that they can do or something that they might would replace just while they have it. So that's just an option. I want to, while you're doing the other, send it off. That way you know the board is working. So when you do get the power and everything going, then you won't, uh, also, you won't hurt your board. Yeah, but do more damage too, by putting right? bad voltage or something. Which could have been the cause of why it's not working to begin with. Could have been power supply shorted out, sent more voltage in the board than, than should have been sent, and then all of a sudden it shorted out. It so be. there's just some options there to, you know, while you're doing that, they could be checking your board, or by the time it gets in, you've got everything else ready. And it won't prolong your make your project longer than it needs to be. And you can find a list of guys that we recommend for board repair mm-hmm. on our website at arcaderepairtips.com slash resources, Tim. Right. So if you go to slash resources, there's a board repair section you can go to. And under that section, we have several people we recommend for board repair. You can try contacting one of them, and hopefully they can test your GORF board if that's the way you want to go. And Tim, I think it's a great suggestion because, like you said, I think that will help him get the project done faster. It may be worth, like I said, most of some of them may do it for free just if you'll pay the shipping. Or very little cost, you right. know, just to test it and see if it plays. Right, exactly. And then they could determine what's wrong with it and quote you a price. Right. Most of them are going to do that anyway. Exactly. Because you tell them, I can't see it because I'm working on all this other stuff. They'll look at your board. That would be a good, my suggestion anyway. Sounds good. So, Tommy, hopefully that answers your question. Check out our video on replacing a power cord, probably the first step. And then make sure you're checking all of your power supply voltages, making sure everything's getting to the board correctly. And then once all of the power supply stuff's taken care of, still having problems with your board, maybe check out one of our board repair guys. We talked about earlier, Tim, inspecting an arcade board. Our video on that may be a great place to start. Um, and then it, once you're, you're sure the board's okay then maybe if you're still not getting picks, your monitor may be an issue at that point. Maybe. So you, you've got the trifecta here, Tim. Right. Power supply, board, monitor. Right. That's like everything that can go wrong with your game. <laughs> and you'll be like a game expert by the time you get done. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, it's not it's not that bad. Definitely think you can tackle it here, Tommy. So good luck with that GORF project, and please let us know if we can help you out in any way. Okay, Tim, the next one is from Rory. And uh, somebody mentioned Rory's question up uh, earlier here, and so we're going to go on with this. Hi, Tim and Jonathan. Hi. Hey. Hey, what's going on? What's up, Rory? I have a Tron cocktail cabinet in great condition that I've owned for 14 years. Wow. That's a long time. It worked perfectly until I moved it to climate-controlled storage five years ago. And, and Tim, this is another uh, one of those um, until I moved it stories, right? Yes. Yes. Until I moved it to storage five years ago. I just took it out of storage last month and moved it back home, and now it isn't starting. The marquee backlights work, but no sounds. The monitor boots up, but it just has a black and white still pattern. It is not responsive to any buttons or coins. I've removed the PCBs and reinstalled them, hoping it was a simple connection issue, but it this didn't help. I also tried juggle... Juggling? Juggle? Juggle. I think it might be jiggle. jiggle. Yeah. yeah. J- okay, jiggle the ICs a little, but the screen is pretty similar or identical. I check the fuses and don't see any blown fuses. No obvious oxidation. Any advice you might have on how to troubleshoot this issue or common faults would be awesome. Or if you've already tackled something like this, please let me know. Thanks so much in advance for the help, Rory. So Tim, we got Rory here. Got a Tron cocktail, okay? And it was working fine. Had it for 14 years. It was working (laughs) fine until he moved it five years ago, right? Right. And uh, until I moved it is a very common problem with a lot of games, Tim. Uh, It seems like it's all held together by dust, and as soon as you move it, the dust goes away. Well, it's set in storage for five years, so it didn't just move it. True. It's It's set in storage. in storage. That's the key word But it was working when he put it in. Right. Okay, so, I mean, that is something. And it's weird because we've seen games, we pull out of storage and plug them in, and they work just fine. Absolutely. After depends years on the game. in storage. Right, it depends on the game. And, you know, it depends on how much of a hack job the wiring is, too, and other things. That's know, true. Obviously. So, so now, he's getting marquee lights, Tim. Uh-huh. Now, that's important, okay? We're getting marquee lights, but no sounds. Right. And we're just getting a black and white still pattern on the screen. Uh-huh. Okay, so you got all that. So, from from your experience, what what's going on here? What's the problem? Well, generally, when something sets for a long time, that the capacitors and stuff will dry up and I normally suspect the power supply. Right. That's and we we always we say that always start at power. Yes. And uh you know so Tron has this um you know it's not the switching power supply like the picture we showed earlier. In fact, you got a picture of its power supply. Yes. And and so what we have here is the Midway 9412 power supply um and this is a picture from Bob Roberts 10, but you can see here, yeah, this is this is a linear type power supply that you have. Um and it's found in most Tron cabinets, but um you know, I will echo what somebody's saying in the chat here too. The interconnect cables 
are notorious on Trump. And they get kind of brittle over time. Especially, now, considering it has in climate controlled storage, that would hopefully help. that helps. Right. But absolutely need to look at those interconnect cables. And uh, Bob Roberts has a nice, a nice article on his website about those, too. That was the key out. word uh, that I didn't mention that first off is because it'd been in climate control. Right. Normally, I would think that the ribbon cables, heat and stuff really can affect those a lot. Right, but we are climate controlled. Right. So hopefully, those cables are still intact, but still but great, worth taking a look at. Great thing to check. Yeah, and Andrew's right here. Definitely check the interconnect cables. But the reason why we're going to start at power, Tim, and you, know, you want to make sure your wiring and connections are all great, but a lot of people know that there's a battery, and this one you'll see is replaced with a coin cell, but yes. there's a battery right here. That's a standard NICAD battery, yes. okay, nickel cadmium. That if it goes bad, it will leak acid all over the place, right? And it will cause all sorts of issues. So, Tim, let's say you had a NICAD battery in climate controlled storage on a board for five years, just sitting there, right? Good chance it could blow up, good chance it could start leaking or something else. And so, in this particular case, I do think that the battery is going to be a very important part on this because he needs to make sure that it is not corroded the rest right. of his board. Even if he had, it had been upgraded to this type of battery to here, the lithium. That, to the lithium battery, the, I, I, I guarantee you that battery won't last three, five years either. Well, usually, though, lithium batteries don't leak. No, they don't leak. Which is why they, we put the coin cells in But there. They, will, they will run low voltage or right. die. Right, and then you'll have issues. You right. have to replace them. Right. And which is a common problem that I'm having now at Chuck E. Cheese. You have a lot of newer games with computers in them. Eventually, those batteries go bad and it stops the game and then it. yeah and then the game will just go crazy and you can't get it back you got to get the cmos all set back up to make it come on automatically right things like that so yes i agree that um it definitely could be the battery being that it's a tron right but we're always going to start a power with issues like this make sure all the wiring and connections and voltages coming in from the wall plug and all the power supply pcb are good make sure that the battery located on the power supply board is not corroded it could have gone bad in the last five years while in storage. And, that, and Tim, that's what we're talking about here. And then, Tim, there's a great article on, on Bob's side, of course, about the 9412. We talked about the 9411 earlier. I mean, that's really what it came down to. This is a 9412 that's in here. And so you can find that on Bob Roberts' site bobarbs.net slash midway.html. And that will tell you all about that power supply, including how to rebuild it, and give you this image right here. So, I mean, great stuff right there if you want to do a rebuild on the power supply. Correct. Make sure your voltage is good before suspecting the board. That's always one of our rules. Make sure the voltage is good before suspecting the board. I agree. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's what we're going to recommend for you, Rory. Now, if the board does have problems, then if you if voltages are good, you're still having problems, contact us again. We can help you out with troubleshooting the board. But right now, we're going to go with power supply. Check that battery. Check the check all of the um, all of the areas of the power supply. Make sure that everything is good. And those interconnect can cables that Andrew mentioned earlier, because those are very problematic in Tron machines. I agree. So hopefully answers your question, Rory. Um, and Tim, that was kind of a last minute one. He kind of snuck it in, in yeah. like literally yesterday That's on right. uh, on the um, episode. Good question. Yeah, the episode three comments, I mm -hmm. think. So yeah, great question from Rory and uh, good stuff there. Now, Tim, that's all the questions. Okay. Okay. I think we're going to run a little over, guys. So if you're watching this, um, I don't think we're going to end quite at 6.30. Okay. So I'm warning you up front. And there may be an after show. I don't know. All right. <laughs> I don't know for sure. You've heard I'm not saying anything. I've heard a rumor there may be an after show. But um, anyway, so yeah, that's really what it comes down to with Rory, though. Power supply first, then go to the other stuff from there. Okay, Tim, uh, anything else that you want to cover here before we get into your tech tip? No. Let's go on to the tech tip of the week. So Tim's tech tip. Using LEDs for marquee lighting. Now, Tim, we are going to tease this one. We do have a video on replacing a marquee light with an LED fixture coming up. Yeah. It's short, but it's pretty to the point. In that video, we use this LED Concepts under cabinet light bar. It's a 12-inch bar, uh, warm color, um, and it's about $15. Right. So for $15, bucks, you can put an LED marquee light in your game. Yes. Okay, that's what you're telling me. Now, Tim, we were talking about this topic, and you said you know that they make replace like basically fluorescent replacement LED bulbs now. Well, it's kind of new, right? I, and I just noticed it one day. I was like, because I have been using the LED bulbs for quite a while, right? But you have, like the screw in just regular bulb type. Well, ones, right? that and the fluorescent kind, okay. but you had to rewire. In other words. Currently, you have wire going to one side. Let's see if I can get this on the screen. Then one to the other side. There you go. You have wires running from one to the other. Right. And what the new LED bulbs, 
require that both your wires come in on one side. The other side is just a light holder. Right. Doesn't do anything. But you do have to kind of modify it. That's all changed. Okay, so they fixed it to where now it basically well, taking them out. They're right. out there. Okay. You have to find them and make sure that uh, that there are no modifications. In other words, I know for a fact that my local Lowe's and Home Depot are selling replacement bulbs. The only problem is they're not selling the 18 inch, which is really common in games. Right. But they are selling a 24 inch, which you can get in a lot of games. Right. So especially like the four player cabinets. You could like literally that. buy a uh, a fixture at Walmart, then go to Home Depot and get the LED bulb and just pop it in there and plug it up, and it worked right without having to do a lot of wiring. So that is my tip of the tip of the uh, month is that if you didn't know that, or let's say you have the kind of lights like we have in our kitchen, the four foot long ones, right, and that's what I put here, or in the shop, right. They have those plug and play now where you can just pop that bulb in there and you got LED light. Right. Great for longer fixtures in your shop work area. Four foot, eight foot. Yes. Fixtures, awesome. Right? Now, some available for marquee size fixtures as well. You really have to do your research like Tim mentioned on that. Yeah. You might check eBay and Amazon and other place other places for that. And this is what they I look like. I think they'll you guys eventually will come out with um, with those with that size right but this led concepts one that we use the 12 inch it was bright enough to power pretty much any oh, yeah. key it looked and good and it was only 15 bucks there you go okay and here's a picture for the of whole it. fixture and everything for everything it came with the clips to hold the fixture it came with the power cord um it, it came with literally everything and it was super easy i will say this i am a huge fan of led lighting because yes. it is so much it has a a nice look behind a marquee and it's so much cooler right it's not just that it looks good it is cooler actually, temperature yeah wise. cooler temperature right. wise because it actually uh, you guys have seen especially when I think about like pinball glasses how the stuff peels I've seen a lot of marquees that are just crumbling and you you, you look at them you take them out and they just fall all the pieces right and uh, I can always think about I've never seen a Mortal Kombat almost that every time we took the marquee out had that, and I'm looking at this Raiden over here beside us. That type just really does some damage under a, a hot light. Right. So this is something I do think that everybody should be going to uh, for the longevity of your marquee. On the, on the screen for everybody. I think not only for the longevity of your marquee, but I do, then at the same time, I think it really pops and looks great. Absolutely. So you have options. You can replace the whole fixture, Tim, for 15 bucks. You can try to get a fluorescent uh, tube replacement LED bulb, right? An LED, an LED bulb fluorescent tube replacement. Yes. Uh, you can go that route. So, I mean, there's options for you, but really, Tim, now is the time. Why replace it with another fluorescent bulb when you can get you an LED bulb or an LED fixture, right? Yeah, for pretty much the same price now. Yeah, I mean, it's gotten so cheap, there's no reason to shy away from it anymore. Exactly. Right? So that's what it comes down to. Tim, thanks for your tech tip. Now, uh, we have a couple of discussion questions here. We're going to move into that real quick. And so let's go ahead and get to those. And the first one here is, Tim, we celebrate our ninth anniversary. Wow. Do you realize years. next year will be 10 years of arcade repair tips? Uh, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's a long time. You know, so um, we were founded, Tim, on May 8th, 2008. So wow. this is a little trivia for you, all you guys out there who want to know about arcade repair tips. The first post was posted on May 8th, 2008. It was the parts of an arcade cabinet. I remember that. It does not have a video. Okay. It's just a post, but you can find it there. It's got a picture, and it's still up on the website. But, Tim, we really want to thank everybody who has read, watched, listened to, and or contributed to our content these past nine years. We greatly appreciate it. Which means all of you who are watching, thank you. Yes. So, mm -hmm. nine years of arcade repair tips seems like a really long time. I feel really old all of a sudden. <laughs> but when we started this thing, you have kids. So, I mean, uh, it really has changed. But uh, it's good stuff. I think thank I was you guys. your age. Yeah. <laughs> so, there you go. Pretty pretty close to it. So, um, a lot of changes in these nine years, guys. But we want to thank you guys for being a part of arcade repair tips. And, Tim, we brought more people on since then. We've got Eric and Chris here. we got Louie. we got more staff than what yes. we had when we initially started. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a really good thing. We've been able to go to a lot of shows, meet a lot of great people. Um, because of Arcade Repair Tips. So thank you guys so much for everything that you've done for us. We do appreciate it. And Tim, 10 years next year, we're going to have to do something special. Yeah, we're going to have to have a big party. Yeah, somebody, I, okay, here we go. Uh, ideas from the chat room. Ideas of what to do for a 10th uh, anniversary. Yes. So there we go. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you guys stew on that while we go to the next discussion question. And Tim, uh, this was something that was brought up by Louie our Facebook uh, moderator, and he really wanted us to talk about it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, but it has to do with uh, Coleco Holdings, LLC, targeting the homebrew publishers and product promoters. And Tim, I, we're not going to go over all of this, but um, we will say that there's a, a post that you can read on the Atari Age forums uh, from Rob, who runs 
uh, ColecoVision fan FB page. Okay. okay. And and basically it's everything that he's gone through through this whole or- ordeal. You can read there. There's the URL. We'll put it in the show notes too, so you guys can uh, check it out. But Tim, here's the summary of it. I wrote up a summary. It says. The Coleco Fan FB page received several trademark infringement notifications from Facebook filed by Coleco over homebrew games that were promoted, not produced by them. Coleco seems to be under the impression that ColecoVision fan page is making these homebrew games, which isn't the case. They're only promoting them. Okay. But because they were promoting them, Coleco decided to file a trademark infringement on these games. Okay. Okay, so that kind of sets a very dangerous precedent. I would think so. Is you know, it, it basically says that, uh, you know, it's like anybody who links to any homebrew or anything like that. I mean, imagine if Nintendo did this and took down all like the fan sites and and YouTube videos that were linking their stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a big deal, right? And so that's what Coleco's doing here is they're actually telling people who are you know homebrew fans and things and fan and these fan sites, hey, we don't want you distributing our stuff. We exactly. don't want you making stuff with trademarks on it or anything. And so in doing that, it kind of kills that homebrew slash fan community. And and, right. and a lot of people argue that that community is why they have anything to begin with. Like right. Why they're exactly. making money is because of this community. So it really is it really is an interesting thing. So, Tim, I have a response here, and this is what I wrote up. I mean, many see this as a strong arm tactic by Coleco to make money by forcing fan sites and homebrew publishers to officially license any content that's related to ColecoVision system. Okay, no matter what it is. Coleco counters that some of the entities that they have allowed to use their IP have taken advantage of it and have used it in ways they did not approve of, including promoting adult content for the console. So they began a campaign to stop these illicit, the illicit use of the tra- the marks of, on third-party IPs trying to get them to officially license. So Tim, my question to you is, which one do you see? Whose side do you, th- do you side more with? Do you side with... Um, the fan sites and the homebrew publishers that are saying, hey, we think that they're trying to shut us down. This is a bad thing. Or do you see Coleco's side as well saying, you know, people have improperly used our IP, and because of that, we're going to crack down on that a little bit more. I mean, so which one do you think? Do you think it's a mix of both? Do you think it's one or the other? Well, or? we are being recorded here, so I'll give my official statement. Okay. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. Well, that's true. And I, you, so you feel like uh, Coleco's I feel doing like that. that it's just, it's, it's, it's uh, targeting people who love your product. Right. They're not trying to uh, deface your product or make it or, or take you down or to sell something. They're homebrew people. They're just trying... They love your stuff. Right. So, really, you should be celebrating the fact that after 20 or 30 years, they're, they even care about you. Exactly, Tim. And like That's you, my opinion. And like you mentioned, I mean, the homebrew community is what's keeping the ColecoVision alive, right? I mean, it's not right. like Coleco is making new games. And it's not the original Coleco company either. Right, right. So it's just somebody that, it's kind of like, you, you are you a gamer at all yourself? Right. You know, so there it sounds like there's some people running the company that are more concerned about... Uh, profits and things than they are about the people right which always in my opinion leads to uh, a bad end exactly and i think that's really what it comes down to now if you guys have thoughts about this you can share them in the live chat uh youtube puck says boo coleco holdings is basically yes. the company mm-hmm. um this is an original coleco company it's a corporation that bought the rights and patents to the coleco name that is true i understand people wanting to protect that we wouldn't want somebody taking an arcade repair tips name and trying to do something else or or right. pretending or I, even if we gave that, let's say we gave somebody permission to do that. Let's say we gave them permission to make YouTube videos, but then they had friends that made YouTube videos as well, and we didn't get permission for that. You know what right. I'm saying? I mean, so that's the thing. I understand, like, you have to protect your IP. So what you do is you make it easy. Right. You say, if you want to, show us your stuff first, and then we'll approve. We'll give you official, make some kind of nice certificate and give it to them that right. they're an official person that can make a game. Well, I, I think something. what it comes down to, though, is you that they it. want money for it. Exactly. Okay. That's where the problem is to me. You're wanting money for some for nothing. Right. Money for nothing. That's a great 80s tune. And you your know? chicks for free. Exactly. So they're wanting, they're just wanting money. Right. And that sounds greedy, and that sounds corporate greed, and that is not a uh, a good topic these But at days. the same time, they do own the license. They, they well, are the IP holders. So here's the way I look at so it. So what are they making with this license? Right. Well, it's true. It's true. They're not doing anything right, right. now. Right. So where's the new console coming out? Right. Where's the Coleco 2020? Yeah. 
Now, if you're going to do something, if you're going to be strict about your license, then be Nintendo and do something with it. Make right. make a new system. Make some new games. Make a home uh, uh, collectible one that everybody can buy. And they do have and, that. And, though. There is a home collectible one out there now with the old games on it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's out there for you to buy. That's probably what they're making money off of. Yeah. I, I think what it comes down to, though, if I was an IP holder like this, I would say, okay, homebrew community, if you do it for free, I'm not going to charge you anything. And Agreed. if you are going to charge for it, I'm going to make minimal license fees. It'll be cheap for you. Okay, so, and I'll, I'll do it on a percentage. I would say, like, you know, 5% of whatever you charge. Right, but okay. as long as it's for home use, what are you, what are you, what are you hurting anyway? Right, but I mean, if, you know, somebody's got, somebody's making $50 per homebrew game on something. I mean, I do think that they should get a cut of it. Maybe so. Maybe yeah. a little bit. I'm not or saying sure. they should get a lot, but I mean, at the same time, they should probably get a cut of it if they're charging for it. Yes. If it's free, I say you leave it out there. But at the same time, I mean, you don't want people plastering Coloco, uh, ColecoVision on all sorts of stuff that's, you know, like they said, adult content or whatever. You may not want that. Correct. Okay, so it's just hard. I understand from their. Per- I understand both sides of it. Right. I do think that they. There should be a middle. Right. I, I do. And maybe think that mediation they- is a good thing to do. You right. find somebody that can mediate and come up with a solution. Right. If I was a homebrew guy, I'd immediately reach out to Coleco Holdings and say, "Hey guys, I'm making this game. Uh, you know, I want to. You know, I want to know what you think." Right. Or what? What, you, what is it okay? You know all that kind of stuff, um, and you know if they approved or disapproved, I could decide what I want to do from there. At the same time, I do see that people have a right to make homebrew for the system. I mean, if you want to make your own games, fan sites have a right to cover that homebrew. Correct. And so you know, I think you have to be careful as a rights holder to say, okay, this is okay, this is okay, this is not okay. But you need to be clear about that. And I think that's where Coleco has has n- not been clear. They have not been clear about the expectations they have from fan sites and homebrew as to what you know, what they expect. Agreed. So spell that out and tell people. And I think that you'll have a lot better communication overall. So anyway, so, and Tim, we have a couple other things. I don't think Coleco can prove any harm is done. It's fair use. Um, and then Coleco chameleon, Tim. If people, yeah, people that's kind of funny. So. Okay. So we're going to go on here, Tim. Are you telling me, are we close? To, do we need to wrap it up? I need to. Okay. I, I have a, I well, need to make a stop. By. Okay, well, we only got like one more thing to talk go about. Ahead, okay, go. we're going to go for it here. So uh, the last thing here on the outline is the Star Wars 40th Anniversary Pinball Machine by Stern, Tim. They just announced it yesterday, of all things. And this is going to be a Steve Ritchie game? It's Steve Ritchie game. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, now uh, what you see here are pictures of the Pro, Premium, and Limited Edition models, Tim, and they look pretty nice. It's interesting. The, the artwork is different on all three. Yes, it's a little yeah, and you know they usually do that, Tim. Yeah. Um, you know, just depending on the game, but uh, the pro model looks pretty nice. The uh, premium, of course, and limited edition. And then Tim, let's do some play field here, and you'll see the pro model, the premium model, and the Star Wars ACDC version. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, the reason why we put this here is because a lot of people are comparing the layout to ACDC. I see. They're saying I see. <laughs> no, ACDC. Yeah. Um, but they're comparing it to ACDC. It's very similar, Tim, and as you can see. I can't really zoom in here, but you know, here's the train, you know, right up here, and then you've got the little guitar solo shot here. You got like the bell shot up here. You've got the drop targets over on the side, just like what you have with ACDC. And so a lot. There's been an argument, Tim, that Stern is now trying to uh, basically keep a lot of the similar design elements from previous games when they make new games, but maybe just change the code in order to accommodate whatever the new game is. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about them reusing designs, basically, and just slapping new code on it for that game? Uh, it's good business. I don't... Yeah. I mean... It's been done for years. Yeah, I mean, it's not new. And they've done it before, like Shrek, Family Guy. Well, sure. You know, I mean, there's been a lot... There's a history of this, and so it's not like it's new. Do you like it, though? It doesn't bother me one way or another. If the game is fun and looks good and right. can play, ACDC is a fun game. What? Yeah. What you would think though is, um, what would be nice is them to be honest and just say, "This is what we've done. We're so we're not going to have to charge quite as much because we didn't have to put so much into engineering." Yeah, now, they ain't gonna do that. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> that's not gonna happen. Now you will see that these, and I'll go back here, Tim. These have the new LCD screen. Yes. Versus the old DMD. Right. Okay, so they've gone to these LCD screens. Of course, uh, Aerosmith had it. Batman 66 mm-hmm. had it. A lot of games had them. And so I'm sure that the coding portion of this was a lot more challenging because of that. Probably. You know, so even though they're reusing the ACDC layout, I mean, not quite the same, but very similar layout, the coding part of this is going to take a lot more because of those LCD screens over the DMD. Sure. So, I mean, so I mean, I think, like you said, it is what it is. But, I mean, does that one make you want the game any less? 
No, nope. no. Nope. Yeah, if you're a Star it. Wars fan, still want to play it. Uh, if you got the money, you know, and you're a big Star Wars fan, you're probably going to own one. So sounds good. Well, Tim, I think we'll wrap it up there because I mean, you said you need to go, and we need to we need to get out of here too. So let's talk about the contact information real quick. Um, if you're in the chat, last call. Is this last call? Yeah, last, last call, call <laughs> for chat room. Um, James Bates says, "Hi guys, I'm new." Hey James. Hey James. So nice we're gonna say to meet hi. You. Welcome. So anyway, let's continue on with the contact information here, Tim. Of course, we have our general email address at questions at arcaderepairtips.com. Questions at arcaderepairtips.com. You guys can send them there. If you put live show in the subject, it'll get mentioned on the live show, Tim. There That's you go. the way it works. So send us an email at questions at arcaderepairtips.com. We also have our YouTube page, which you guys are on right now, and that's at youtube.arcaderepairtips.com. Uh, any comments from the last live show will be covered in the next episode, just like we did tonight, Tim. Imagine that. So there you go. Uh, again, that's youtube.arcaderepairtips.com. You guys can come here and leave your comments on this live show episode, and we'll cover them on the next show. Tim, we also have a podcast, and it's now hosted by Eric and Chris. It used to be hosted by you and me, right? Yes. But now it's hosted by Eric and Chris. It's a completely separate entity of Arcade Repair Tips, but it is a great thing to check out. It's an audio podcast with lots of great information and a lot of answers to your questions. You guys can check that out at iTunes.ArcadeRepairTips.com and Stitcher.ArcadeRepairTips.com. You guys go give them a review because they're working really hard, Tim, to make sure that that podcast keeps going and they put some great information out there. So you guys go give them a review on one of those pages and email them if you have questions for them at podcast at arcaderepairtips.com. I'm sure they would appreciate it as well, Tim. Give them some hard ones. They're good. Yeah, that's right. Give them the hard questions. You can give us the easy ones. Yes. That's how it works. <laughs> no, uh, really, though, Chris and Eric, between them, lots of experience in arcade repair. Two great guys carrying on a great a great legacy of the Question and Answer podcast, right, yes. Tim? I mean, I know uh, we kind of set it up for them, but they've taken the ball and ran with it, and it's, uh, it's really a, a great avenue for you guys to get more in-depth information on arcade repair. And then, Tim, we have our social media pages at facebook.arcaderepairtips.com and twitter.arcaderepairtips.com. And, Tim, on both of those, you can look and find the Fast Company article that we posted that we talked about earlier in the podcast on the origin story of Chuck E. Cheese. Right. Which has to do with um, Showtime Pizza yes. and Showbiz Pizza and a whole bunch of other things. Nolan Bushnell, Atari. Big Cheese. Big Cheese. Find out who Big Cheese is. Yeah, and the, and the Rick Rat. Rat. Rick Rat. Is in there too. So you guys read the article on the origin story of Chuck E. Cheese. Great information there and fun. Well, Tim, done. Live show in the books, and you've got to go. Yes. And nobody's saying anything else. All right. So I guess we can sign off here. So uh, next live show episode, we should get to in real quick. Uh, let's see here. We got the sixth of July. Okay. That sound right? See you right. Two days after the fourth. Two we'll days celebrate. after the fourth. You guys have a great Independence Day. Okay, and we'll see you on July 6th at 5.30 p.m. Tim, you're going to come over here again? Yes. Awesome. And YouTube Punk says, back, just rescued two dogs. Good job. <laughs> Rescuing dogs is important, too, just like arcade repair, right? Yeah. But anyway, guys, thank you for joining us tonight. We're signing off here. But um, thank you guys so much for joining us. Nine, nine years, Tim, of Arcade Repair Tips has been fun with you, doing things. New video coming soon, hopefully, once I get editing done. And... We look forward to seeing you on July 6th of not before. All right. So, guys, uh, thank you guys again for tuning in. And remember, here at Arcade Repair Tips, when you fix the game, you play, play the, the game. game. Take care, everybody, and good night. Here we go. So long. So long. Oh, he's already walking off. He's gone. Thank you for watching this episode of the Arcade Repair Tips live show. All of our past episodes are available on our website at ArcadeRepairTips.com or on our YouTube page. This show is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. Please consult a professional before attempting to repair any coin-operated machines yourself. The preceding program is a Varcade Entertainment production.